Hi everybody, this is Robert Roundtree at FloridaMarijuana.net and we are dedicated to the medicated. That's why today we bring you Senator Jeff Brandis. He is a senator from the Tampa Bay area and he has, in our opinion, the best bill to address the ongoing issues surrounding Amendment 2. Open competition, allow doctors to be doctors, eliminate the 90-day wait, and allow the doctor to prescribe medication for whatever length of time they want. No more 45-day requirement. Now, let's get into the show. A well, a well of the solution. Hey, everybody. We're speaking with Senator Jeff Brandis. He is uh, one of the state representatives uh, from the Tampa Bay area. He recently introduced a bill, which, in my opinion, and most of the people we talk to, is going to be our best path to getting a sensible cannabis policy in Florida. Uh, how are you doing today, Senator? I'm doing great. Glad to be with you. Certainly. So since I started letting people know I was going to be talking to you, there's been a flood of questions, and I'll just break them down into what I think are the four most important. Uh, first off, what's your plan to do with the cannabis cartels? I, I've read the bill, but most people haven't, so that's why we've had you on. Right. So uh, as your listeners probably currently know, there's there's seven families that are essentially authorized to uh, produce medical marijuana in Florida, and they have to be vertically integrated, which means they can, they not only do they have to be good at growing, they have to be good at processing, selling, as well at the retail level. So they have to be they have to own the entire business structure um, up and down the up and down the marketplace, uh, and uh, and that is essentially going to create high prices, monopolies, um, where only one or two uh, growers or, or you know, these medical marijuana companies operate in certain jurisdictions, which will lead to higher prices and less consumer access. And so we think that's an absolutely wrong model. Uh, it was originally designed for a thousand sick kids with epilepsy. The one the first bill was first proposed uh, a few years ago. And when you have potentially hundreds of thousands of patients now, that model doesn't work. And our argument is pretty simple that, that we should decentralize that market. We should not, well, we should not require vertical integration. I mean, we should prohibit it, but we shouldn't require people to be vertically integrated. And, uh, we should let good growers grow, good processors process, and good retailers do retail. And so how does the licensing structure that you're proposing work? Uh, is it going to be kind of open-ended? Uh, will there be a cap? Um, does it tie into No, we don't, well, I don't now? think that you put put caps on marketplaces uh, for the most part it, we're I mean we have the, the only real cap that we have on our on our in our bill is that you can only have one medical marijuana license in a city per 25,000 residents uh, that's, this is to deal with the major concern from my constituents that oh, we don't want to pot shop on every corner so great we'll we'll limit it to one per 25 if a city wants zero we can have zero but it can't restrict delivery into their community so for we think it's largely a delivered product to your home your hospice wherever you are um, and we think that's how we continue to provide a free and open market uh, for for medical marijuana and, and, and provide access and, and keep prices low. Okay, and um, some states where places don't have dispensaries within X amount of miles, patients don't have access, they, they've allowed patients to cultivate and their caregivers in those limited circumstances. Is that something you would entertain in the future? I don't think it passes the House of the Senate, um, and frankly, I don't think uh, I, don't, I don't think it, it's something that is a it would be taken seriously in the state uh, by the legislature. Uh, I think it's most of, most of the time, uh, I think you're you're you correctly identified. It's largely for very very rural states, and I think uh, that Florida could provide access uh, via delivery without without um, without home grow. Okay. Fair enough. Um, it's definitely going to be a tough battle here regardless. Um, so we talk a little bit real quick just about how the process goes. You've got a bill. There's the Brantley bill. There is the Department of Health rules. And at some point, do these all come to try and intermingle together? Or does the legislature just dictate to the Department of Health at some point if Legislation that's correct. I mean, understand the, the Department of Health is is not an entity that's paid to have courage. They're paid to you know and and uh, and go off on their own and create law. They're they're there really to execute laws 
one, the Constitution, and then two, any statutes that uh, that that are implemented. That they're really painted to kind of uh, focus on putting together the, the process by which uh, the, the statutes are written. And so I think you're going to see them doing rulemaking authority and, and, and pushing for rulemaking authority, but they're going to only do that within the scope of, of the law which they think they have. So ultimately, um, you need a, a new statute put in place. I mean, I always think the constitutional amendment is kind of the outline of the story, and, and it's up to the legislature to really write the write the rest of the story. And then we usually leave some blanks to be filled in via rule by the departments. So, But we have to authorize them to fill in those blanks. So at the end of the day, I think myself and Senator Riley's bills are, are probably the two uh, probably the two major pieces of legislation, and I think we haven't seen what's going to come out of the House yet. Uh, so you know we're hopeful that they're they're sticking to their free market guns, and we'll be uh, of of a like mind to some of the free market principles that we've put into our piece of legislation. Absolutely, our, our governor is always running uh, advertising saying we're open for business, so it's been a little disheartening seeing what's going on. Um, well, if you have a speaker of the house who I, I, you have a speaker of the house who I, I, you know, I trust will stand up and um, and stick to his, his free market principles. I think he is someone who has stood on the floor of the, of the Florida House and and said that uh, we are a free market body that we believe we don't believe in picking winners and losers, and that uh, we want to make sure that that all Floridians have opportunities and, and uh, opportunities to participate in business. And I think that that should apply to every business, uh, not just every business with an asterisk except for medical marijuana. And so I, I you know, I, I trust uh, the speaker. He's been a good friend of mine for a long, long time. And so I think, well, I'm, I'm encouraged uh, by his his at least statements on the on the floor of the house. Now, I wasn't specifically speaking about medical marijuana, but um, He's a man that I know that, that doesn't put asterisks on his words. When he says something, he believes in it, and he, and he stands by it. That's good. That's refreshing for uh, to, to hear from politicians because, um, you know, a lot of us that aren't involved in politics have felt kind of disenchanted by uh, what we've been told. And I think wrongfully so, the politicians in Florida right now are taking heat for the Department of Health actions. Um what do you think about the proposed rules, which uh, I feel are un- unconstitutional? Most attorneys I've spoke to, such as them taking away the power from the physician and putting it in the hands of the Florida Medical Board. Well, I think I think at the end of the day, you need a piece of legislation. We're we're going to descend into right. lawsuit hell here shortly if we don't have a, a a piece of legislation this year. There will be lawsuits, like thousands of lawsuits flying around from people who want to get into the business, from patients who want access to the business, from physicians who are getting, who, who, who have good questions about the business, and uh, from investors who, who want to participate. I, I think it's just no end to the, the challenges this state faces if it doesn't pass a statute. And not to mention, to me, the most important part is patients don't get access. They won't have access. They will, you know, cities Absolutely. will continue with moratoriums, and uh, and and the monopolies will, you know, the, the cartel essentially will try to establish itself in, in in the key markets as the sole provider, and they'll do what they do, which is try to keep prices high so that they can they can maximize their revenue. It's it, at, at that juncture, it becomes everything but what it should be, which is let's focus on patients and let's focus on access because the legislature and frankly, the people of the state of Florida have already declared it's a medicine. Absolutely. So um, I guess I'll go back to the original question then. Are, do you support the doctors being able to make the determining uh, other Absolutely. debilitating conditions? Yeah, well, they're, they're, okay. the, they're, the, they're the boots on the ground. I mean, they see patients, they should be... Um, they should be the ones determining what's in the best interest of their patients. Now, if somebody is is doing it nefariously, they should lose their medical license, just like opiate doctors who prescribed opiates without doing physical examinations should lose their their license. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it's, it's ultimately physicians and patients' relationships, and I'm not somebody who believes that they should stand in that way. Yeah, that's uh, that's great to hear. That's what we believe too, and. Um, we can't really restrict the market because 
there's going to be nefarious doctors. There's going to be. People are going to get arrested, have their licenses taken. It's happened in every state. I mean, it's just that's the way it goes. There's always some bad apples. So uh, it, it's good to know we'll just let them kind of rise, find them, and, uh, you know, deal with them properly to keep the uh, industry clean. A big thing that patients right now, and, um, you know, my blog's fairly successful, so I get a lot of people calling, emailing, texting my phone. Uh, a lot of them are staying on the pharmaceuticals at this point because they just cannot afford the medication. Is because right. of, I mean, it's it's multiples higher than the average place uh, cost in other states. So definitely competition will be the only thing that's going to bring that down because um, there's definitely not going to be like a price ceiling instituted. Although that would be nice from a patient perspective. You're going well, I, think, I mean, I think that's the that's the next push. If if you can't, you know, I think I think that's the and that's the perversion of this whole process, right? If if they end up with a monopoly, then they're going to have to put together some type of utility type board to to manage prices, um, because they're because the the monopoly will just and the cartel will have too much pricing power. They will basically be able to set prices in individual markets. The, there, there really isn't a market for medical marijuana. It's really whatever the cartel wills, wills you, to, you know, wants to set it at. And there's no market price. That and it leads to a huge push on the black market because once you, once you have a medical marijuana card, nobody will really know where you got your med- your, your your marijuana from um, if you have it in your possession. And then all of a sudden, it, it just leads to so many other problems. The best thing Florida could do right now is to open the market. Let great growers come in, let those who are passionate about retail come in and help doctors make the right decision on patients and, and access. And what about restrictions on the medication? Right now, um, you can't get access to any flour or any type of product like that. And that's half of the market in every other state. Across right. The I think you should, you know, our bill allows you to sell the, the, the raw flour. So. At the end of the day, we think people are going to uh, vaporize it. If they're going to vaporize it, somebody's going to smoke it. And we should not be in a situation where we're asking ourselves if we're going to put somebody with stage four cancer uh, in the in the in jail. Right. Then that's what it kind of comes down to. Are we going to? It put is. It's a pretty simple argument. Yourself? I mean, at the end of the day, the voters by seventy one percent have voted for medical marijuana. Most of them thought that that included smokables, and we should. Give them what they want, and the, you know the battle has been. We, we've asked the question; it's been answered by the people of the state. And the legislature has a simple responsibility now: provide rational, reasonable access, um, do do the right thing by the people of the state of Florida. Because if they don't, what's going to happen is I, my fear, or not my fear, but what I think is going to happen is is there's going to be other referendums to continue to to do this and removing authority from the legislature. Um, it'll, it'll chip away and chip away and chip away until the legislature has no say over it. And the only way to amend it is the Constitution. And that's not good for anybody either. So I, I just think that it sets a horrible precedent. The legislature should listen to the, to the will of the people. The people have loudly and clearly spoken on this issue, and they want access, and they want this to be treated as a, as a medical product. And they uh, they they want to make sure that there's no uh, – it shouldn't be designed as a monopoly. Yeah, it definitely shouldn't. Um, very limited, limited circumstances, as I'm sure you know, or any type of uh, authorized monopoly, okay? You mentioned it earlier when you said you would have to have, like, a utility board for pricing. Um, I'm pretty sure most people paying utility bills don't think those boards work out too well for them. They don't. Um, no, not at all. Um, what about the current requirement that patients have to see their doctor every 45 days to get a continuing recommendation? Some doctors have used that as a reason to price gouge patients. I know doctors that are charging $150 per month, which equals 224 roughly dollars per month. Right. I, like, I think it should be an annual license. I, mean, I think, you know, unless okay. there's some debilitating disease which you're not going to which are, is chronic in nature and is and and um you know but but again it's up to physicians physicians should be able to determine based on the condition or the symptoms of a patient the length of the length of access to a medicine this is not different yeah, than any other medicine we we you, you know in my mind um and it should be treated like that as well 
Yeah, it seems like um, from the what's been going on initially, people are that are writing the rules and regulations, primarily the Department of Health, are uh, treating this like it's a narcotic, uh, even stricter than a narcotic in some instances. Uh, as a, my son's 11 months old, if he broke his leg, I took him to the emergency room. They're not going to ask any questions about prescribing him a narcotic if they think he needs it. But That's true. if he was epileptic and needed to get some cannabis oil to help him, he might have to wait 90 days. So it's really good to right. hear that uh, right. you're, you're supporting that. Did you I'm watch or what? attend or hear what that? Sorry, you say I'm supporting what? Oh, that you're supporting uh, eliminating that and the 90 day yeah, wait. Uh, yeah, get rid of that. I mean, at the end of the day, let's, let's let it. physicians be doctors and let's, you know, let's let them practice medicine. You know, we, the, the people have spoken. 71% have said this is a medicine. They've left it up to the legislature to essentially write the, the rules. Um, the legislature has written woefully inadequate rules to date. Um, the proposal that is the, the other proposals that, that, that I don't support, um, I think they continue to establish a cartel system in Florida and strengthen the cartel system in Florida. And I think wholly undermine the will of the voters. At the end of the day, we should open the market. We should uh, allow, we should uh, get away from vertical integration. And we could, we, but, but ultimately, we should focus and make all our decisions on what's best for the patient, what's best for Floridians, right. and, and stop doing what's best for seven families that, that have established themselves as a cartel in Florida. Yeah, absolutely. Um... What all have you heard in your office? What's been the primary complaints you're receiving from your constituents? Well, I think for the most part, I, I think they're just hopeful that our bill gets a hearing and, and gets some movement. I think they're, you know, I think that we could, you know, spend many, many hours kind of complaining about some of the other pieces of legislation out there and talking about the horrible things that can happen when if that passes or became law. I think what, what they've, what my constituents have been doing is. Focusing on the positive, focusing on uh, the the opportunities that our bill will would enable, and that's what I'm excited about. I mean, I'm excited that that you know whether it be people who want to invest and start uh, in the medical marijuana business, or patients who want access and want to make sure that that uh, you know if they have Lou Gehrig's disease that they'll be able to at least buy the raw flower and uh, and and utilize medical marijuana because they have difficult time swallowing. Will uh, will be able to, to, to participate and, and will be able to have access. So I, I would say that the conversations that I'm hearing are much more hopeful about my piece of legislation uh, than they are than they are bashing the other legislation because it, it's That's really good. you know I think our bill really is the best hope for a free and open market in the state. That's what we think, and let's talk about that. Um, what is going to be the difference? Uh, you know, right now, it's five million dollars bond, all these ridiculous barriers to entry. How would somebody that wants to open up a cultivation under the branches bill be able to do so? So they would go apply for to be a medical marijuana treatment center. In order to be uh, uh, to apply to be a medical marijuana treatment center, uh, the department will have a, a fixed fee um, to apply. And then you'll have to go out and get a million dollar bond. And, a uh, performance and compliance bond. You'll have to show that you have a facility that's able to handle it. You'll have to show that you have security around that facility. You'll show you'll have a, you have to have a process by which you're tracking from seed to sale. Um, all of those types of things, and, and they're pretty clearly delineated in our bill. Uh, and I think uh, we allow for essentially four different types of licenses. We allow you to be a, a grower, a processor, a retailer, and a transporter, a, tra a transportation license. Because again, we think this is largely a delivered product to people's homes or their hospice. And so therefore, we, so therefore we provide a transportation license as well. Okay. And uh, is there any type of scenario where you could get all the licenses or just yes. maybe one no, or two? There's, there's no restriction. We don't put any restriction. And, and, and frankly, we believe that some folks will, will want all licenses and some organizations will like uh, just to grow or just to be the retailer or just to be a transporter. Um, any, they, they'll, they'll, they'll all want access in different ways, but 
uh, we should allow people uh, to to do what they're good at and, and focus and specialize. And to me, requiring you to be good at every piece of the business just uh, just solidifies more of the cartel thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what about safety and efficacy and for third party testing labs? Right. So, I mean, we we. Our third-party testing labs can't be affiliated with any medical marijuana treatment center. Um, they they have to be truly independent, and we have a process by which batches are tested um, and confirmed. And will they also be available to the patient? Because right now, when patients call, myself included, uh, they just they don't have anything for us. You know, it would be up to lab. me as a patient to go find a lab to test it for myself, which would put me at risk, um, mm-hmm. I, I think, because I'm not sure that there's even a legal means by doing that right now. Yeah, I, I don't think that there would be any bur- barrier. I'd have to go back to our piece of legislation. I don't think there's any barrier to you going back to an independent testing lab and saying, look, I, I have, I bought this product. I want you to confirm it's it's. Uh, you know, it's THC levels or it's CBD levels. Okay. If somebody were to do that now and got in trouble, would would you be willing to maybe put in a good word for them? Because I know there's a lot of patients currently doing it. There's been reports. That are uh, going back to the labs? Yeah, there's labs around the state that are testing for patients. Right. If you know the Um, right ones. But it's kind of like us, to be honest with you, Senator, because People are kind of scared that they'll receive backlash if, for some reason, their product and their medicine doesn't test out the way it's supposed to. Well, I think that would be deeply concerning. And, and I think that's probably one of the major challenges with the existing law is it allows the labs to be in-house, not independent. Right. To me, that, that's a, a key component is if you're going to have – if you're going to – Ask the thing be verified that they be verified by a third party, not by a, not by somebody who works for you, for you and your company. Absolutely. And in Washington, I was speaking with a gentleman uh, that runs a cultivation facility out there earlier this week. And in Washington, they have very specific levels, so you can only reach like a certain coliform count, and then it fails. Um, the mold count, everything has a very specific count. Is this going to be something, hopefully, if your bill passes, to work with standards for the labs and what the medication needs to have to be able to come to market? Absolutely. I think we, those, that's the kind of thing that we would leave to the Department of Health, is that they're, they would be much more attuned into uh, into those types, of, those types of issues than the legislature would be, and, and something that we would see being left to them for, for some level of discretion. But I also think it highlights the the issues that you, that if you only have seven families and somebody loses a grow because of mold counts and uh, has to destroy the entire crop, then what happens to the access to that market? Do do they all do they have to shut down? Do they have to um, buy from other growers that are going to raise their prices? I think that that's the part of the problem with the with the limited market. Uh, to seven as it is, is, is you can, you know, and people do regularly lose crows because of mold or pesticides or other issues. That's, uh, we've seen it happen in the state already. Right. It's a significant concern and it, and, and, and it has an opportunity to really constrict, uh, what should be a much more open market. Absolutely. And mold is going to be a big issue in Florida because of the humidity, the sensitivity of the cannabis plant. There's only very few strains that are even made to grow in this type of a condition. So the the cultivators that are grown in the greenhouse don't really need to name names. If you look around, you'll know who's done it. But they, they lost an entire crop, one of the ones right. down in the south. And right. I'm sure that affected market access because uh, they were the only ones down south. Um, right, I think it highlights the problem of if you only have seven growers and one goes down, uh, then then and, and they're the only and they have to be vertically integrated, and they can only sell their own products, then um, then whole markets could be shut off of access. It really puts the business at risk too, because they don't oh, have it puts, any it puts, way it puts to business at risk, it puts the patients at risk. Up. 
um, it, it puts, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense um, at all to me. Um, I'm glad to hear that, that you agree too, because the business is at risk, ultimately the patient's at risk, which is the worst. But it's, from a business perspective, I wouldn't want to be in a position where if I lost my crop, I couldn't go acquire some on the market to continue to serve my patients with a quality product. Right. Um, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. I, I know it's only going to be 30 minutes. We've already kind of exceeded that a little over 10. What is the best way that people around the state that aren't your direct constituents can do to support your bill? Well, I think they need to be, they need to try to get in front of their local elected officials and they need, they need to be very clear that they want an open market, that they want, that they, that they want to, um, that they want their elected officials to fight against the cartel, that they want them to stand up and be free market, uh, that this is not a, a Republican or Democrat issue. This is not a conservative or liberal, or liberal issue. This is about following the will of the voters in the Constitution and that they should put their party aside and they should put their, their, whatever their, whatever their leadership is uh, telling them aside and they should focus on doing the right thing by the patients in their district. And that, that means that they should be focused on access and be focused on, on, um, making sure that the, that, uh, the prices are as low as we can get them, um, in order to provide patients reasonable access to this product. Um, and, and if that means that they have to, you know, write, call, um, you know, and, and get in front of them by, by scheduling meetings with them, uh, and, and to the extent that they can tell them that they want to support the Brandis bill or a bill that's, that, that's open and open like uh, our piece of legislation, I think that only helps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we will have in the comments section links to the House of Representatives and the Senate uh, find your legislator. So everyone listening, click on those links, find out who your representatives are, contact them and get this discussion at the forefront. Because if not, they, they don't really know what the will is. I mean, we see the 71%, the like Senator Brandis is saying, we need to continue the conversation and remind them what we meant with that 71%, because that's a significant amount of voters agreeing on any issue. <laughs> right, well, and it really does come down to uh, individuals sharing their stories with their legislators and holding them accountable. Uh, and, and making sure that they're doing everything they can to share with them, uh, their stories. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of heartbreaking stories out there. People just generally want to have an opportunity to feel better. And, uh, we're glad to get behind your bill and, uh, help everyone become more aware of it, all the good things in it, the open market, the doctors being able to be doctors and business owners able to be entrepreneurs like they are because in an open market, some great things are going to happen in Florida. We, we should really be the leader in the nation behind maybe only California due to population count. Right. Well, I, well, I, I think it's, all, all, just one, just one last thing. I think you can, they should also be asking their legislators, at least in the Florida Senate to co-sponsor mine. To, to go, I mean, the, the surest way that they're going to sh support something it is if they're willing to put their name on it with mine. Um, I've had the courage of my conviction to put my name on this bill. They should have the convert, courage of their convictions to either tell you that they're going to support it by putting their name as a co-sponsor or they're not going to support it. That's right. You decide and let your constituents know where you stand. That's it. Yeah, that, 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 that's the most open, honest way you can deal with it. Um, you know, if you if you're gonna be no against it, then be no. We can respect that. I appreciate all your time today, Senator Brandis. You are a well a well of this marijuana solution. Please join FloridaMarijuana.net and the Marijuana Solutions Show at the Florida Medical Cannabis Conference and Exhibition on May nineteenth to the twenty first of two thousand seventeen. This exciting medical cannabis event is being held at the Saddlebrook Resort and Spa, just north of Tampa, in Wesley Chapel, Florida. The conference covers many facets of the growing Florida cannabis industry, including expert presentations on new medical research, brain health, legal considerations, and financial topics. You can visit their website now at Florida 
medicalcannabisconference.com or get more information by calling 850-558-0609. Early registration discounts are offered until April 15th, so please sign up today at Florida Medical Cannabis Conference. Dot com. You are aware, aware of the Star Wars solution.